to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church. Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. We welcome you today to our study of Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords as presented in the Gospel of Matthew. And so we want to encourage you, if you don't have your Bible, locate it, get it ready, as we're going to look to the Gospel of Matthew to learn more about Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Friend, we're so glad that you've joined us today for our Bible study and our broadcast. We want you to know this is brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ, the Lord's Church in your area. We'd love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, uh, you'll, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study you'll find kind, friendly, loving people there who want to put God first in their life and who want to spread the message of Jesus in truth and love. And so check out the Lord's Church in your area. If you'd like to know more about the church, more about the plan of salvation or worship or moral matters, whatever it may be, you'll find people there who are happy to sit down, open up the Word of God, and study together with you. And friend, we'd also like to help you in your desire to draw closer to God here at the Gospel of Christ. We have a wide variety of good Bible study material. We have lessons on the Old Testament and the New Testament, a litany of topical studies as well that you can access, written material, transcripts, study questions. Our website is just a great tool for Bible study, and we want to encourage you to check it out. If you'd like to have a copy of this series on Matthew or any of our previous lessons, just log on to our website, fill out our free media request form. We can send that to you instantly as a digital download, or if you need a DVD or CD, we can put that into mail to you as well. And friend, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app, available both for the Android and Apple stores. In our fast-paced world where everybody seems to have a smartphone, it's a great way to keep up with what we're doing and study the Word of God in the world we live in today. Today we're thinking about the life and teaching of Jesus Christ the King as He prepares to be ushered into Jerusalem as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His teaching level, His intensity, the, the maturity of what He's teaching is getting more sincere and more serious with every moment. And we begin in Matthew 16 with Jesus telling us about His church and His kingdom and what it is. Look at Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18 with me. Jesus begins by saying these words. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Ren, as you think about Jesus' discussion with His disciples here, He wants to see, are they really getting who He is? Who do, who do men say that I am? Well, they said, some, some people say you're like Elijah, great prophet. Some like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet of old. Some like John the Baptist or, or the other prophets. And Jesus said, okay, 
I understand people maybe who have, don't know me. Who do you say that I am? Peter piped up. He spoke up and said, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Son of God. They had seen the miracles Jesus did. They'd seen him turn the water to wine. They'd seen him take just a, a, a few loaves of bread and a few fish and feed 5,000 men, not including the women. They'd seen Jesus walk on the water. They'd seen all the miracles he did. They reached the right conclusion. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon, blessed are you, for flesh and blood's not revealed that to you. God revealed that to you through what I did. And I say to you that you're Peter, you're a small stone, but on this rock, that bedrock statement, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, what is that church? Then he said to Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. The church is the kingdom. Whose church is it? Did Jesus say, I'm going to build a church? Did he say, I'm going to build many churches? Did he say, I'm going to build some church and whoever wants to can put their name on it? No. Jesus said, I will build my church. The church in the Bible is singular. It was never God's intent that we have a multiplicity of religious groups all wearing a different name, teaching a different thing, under different authority and God. No, that's not God's plan. I will build my church. Jesus said his church is singular. And when you read about it in the Bible, that's always the case. He is the head of the church, which is his body. Ephesians 1, 21 through 23. And then just three chapters later, Paul says, there is one body. You are called into one body and be ye thankful. Colossians 3, 15. There are many members, yet but one body body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20. There's only one church. It's unique. It's singular. It's under the authority of Jesus Christ. And that church belongs to him. Friend, who is it that paid the price for the church? Acts 20, verse 28. The scripture records, Jesus purchased the church with whose, his own blood. Who paid the price for it? Jesus did. Who does it belong to? I will build my church, Jesus said. And so it's singular. Jesus paid the ultimate price of a perfect sacrifice, and its ownership falls under Jesus Christ. These were not made by men. They don't wear men's names. No man has ever died for the church and lived a perfect life. This is different. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is unique because it solely submits to Christ as head. It believes and teaches there is one church. That church belongs to Jesus. It ought to wear His name and bring glory to honor in Him and everything it does and not to men. And its purpose is unique in that it is to strive to reach the world with the gospel. Ephesians 3, verse 10 and 11, it is the divine purpose of God, the eternal purpose of God, that the church should spread the gospel to principalities and powers and all who are in authority. And so Jesus, as he begins to mature his teaching for that audience, teaches about the church. And friend, that ought to remind us that the church is not a denomination. The church is not some man's organization that you can throw any name on and teach any. No, it's Christ church. It belongs to him, and we want to let him be the head of that church. But, you know, with this teaching about the church and what it really is, Jesus also rises the level of teaching, raises the level of teaching about my priorities in this life and what they ought to be. Look in your Bible in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus says these words, verse 26, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus wants his followers to have the proper priorities. And I understand we all have various priorities. 
I've got to provide for my own. Uh, I've got to take care of my family. Uh, I've got to make sure my, my health is what it ought to be. There's a lot of things we've got to do in this life. What's priority number one? Make sure that your eternal soul is prepared to live with God. Let me illustrate this for you in a rather disappointing way. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. There was a man who was a very good businessman. Farmer, had a great crop year. He began to plan for the future. He said, this crop year's been so good, I'll have to tear down barns and build bigger barns. And, and that was a good thing because he had more to put in those barns, could provide for more, could do more with that. So he tore down his barns, built bigger barns. Then he said to his soul, soul, you've got many goods, laid it for many years. Take it easy. You don't have to get up at crack of dawn and go to bed at the, no, you take it easy for a little while. You know that one thing that man forgot? What did God say to that man? You fool, this night will your soul be required of you? Then whose things will those be whom you have acquired? And so is he who is rich but not toward godliness. What's the point? All the planning, all the preparation, all the looking into the future, all the hard work that man did amounted for zero. Why? He forgot the most important thing of all to prepare his soul for eternity. My friend, as Jesus begins to become more assertive with his teaching, he reminds us of the proper priority in life. There's a lot of good things you can do, a lot of things you can get involved in, a lot of things that are important. But hear me well today. If you forget or you neglect to take care of your soul and to prepare it for the other side, you've missed the whole thing. You've missed the whole point. The Hebrew writer would say, how shall we escape? if we neglect so great a salvation. Don't forget what's really, your soul is the most valuable thing you have. Don't forget to prepare it for the other side. Then from Matthew chapter 17, we hear confirmation from all my, after these teachings and the disciples had heard this and the people around had heard this, we hear confirmation from heaven that Jesus is teaching truth. He is the Son of God. Look at Matthew chapter 17, and I want you to listen to verses 1 through 8. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Suddenly a voice came out from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus alone. What's the purpose and point of this transfiguration? That they've seen what Jesus did. They've seen his power. Some of the prophets have done great miracles. They had, uh, they had heard his teaching. Some of the prophets had done that. No prophet ever had verbal confirmation from heaven. This is my son. Hear him. This separated Jesus. Think about who comes there with Jesus. Goes up on that mountain. He's changed before them. He begins to shine so bright no launderer could make it that bright. And, and the disciples are, are afraid. And, and, and Moses and Elijah appear talking with Jesus. And they're talking about his ultimate demise, the text tells us in the other accounts. And Peter, because he's afraid, he doesn't know what to say. He, he cries out, 
Lord, it's good for us to be here. You want us to build three tabernacles to worship? One for you, one for Moses. And before he even finishes that statement, it's as though he's still saying that, and boom, out of heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear him, not Moses, not Elijah. Jesus is the son of God, the one we listen to. We learn from this transfiguration, not only the confirmation of God on his son, but it's amazing that Peter's cut off and Jesus alone is left there with him. His word, his teaching, his law is what we must follow today. But you know, there's also an interesting point about the transfiguration that Peter thinks on later and it shows us the power of God's Word. Peter says in essence, this is 2 Peter 1 verses 16 through 21, he says in essence, you remember on that holy mountain when we heard God's voice as it were, and it came down from heaven. Peter will say, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. And no scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Peter actually literally heard the voice of God. And Peter said, what we've written and what we have is as confirmed as the voice of God, which we heard on that mountain. The transfiguration, great approving of God of His Son there. Peter uses that as an illustration to show we've got that same voice of God in the Bible today. And so we hear the confirmation of Jesus and His teaching by Almighty God. Let's think about that kingdom then. What's unique? What are some of the things that are unique? Jesus said, I'll build my church. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. That voice from God was heard affirming his teaching. What's unique about the kingdom of the Lord? The greatness. Who's great in the kingdom makes it so unique and so different from anything you've ever been a part of before. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 18. This is what's great about the kingdom. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Can you imagine that? Well, what's it like to be great? in the kingdom of heaven. Are we going to sit on the chief seats? Are we going to sit in Moses' seat? Are, 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 are we going to look down on everybody? Uh, uh, the greatest in the kingdom going to rule with power and pomp and prestige? Jesus said, guys, let me show you what it's going to be like. And he looks out in the crowd. Here's a little child. He says, come here. You see this little child right here? If you'll be converted and be like him, you can be greatest in the kingdom. It, 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 Jesus said, you want to be first? You want to be first in my kingdom? Get to the back of the line. You want to be last? Try to run first. Jesus said, it's not about who can get there the quickest. It's not about who's got the most power and prestige. It's about being converted and becoming like a little child, humbling yourself, submitting to God, doing God's will. That's what makes you great in the kingdom of God. And so it's not about running to the first of the line. It's not about who's got the most power, who can do the most things. No, it's about the heart. Is my heart really right with God like it ought to be? Have I submitted to the will and teaching of Jesus Christ? And then here's something that's unique. In the kingdom of the Lord, marriage is designed to be permanent in this life. Look at Matthew 19, and I want you to see what Jesus says about marriage. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to Jesus, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read, he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother 
and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command? to give a certificate of divorce and put her away. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. The kingdom of Christ is unique because we honor the sanctity and the privilege of marriage. You see, these Pharisees are at it again. They're trying to trick Jesus, and so they, they come to Jesus, and they, they want to pit Jesus against Moses, one of their great heroes. And Jesus won't allow that. And, of course, Moses wouldn't be pitted against him anyway. But here's what they say. What do you say, Lord? Moses commanded us to put away our... Can you divorce your wife for just any reason? Moses commanded us according to the law to do that. What do you say? Can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Jesus goes beyond Moses, back to the original pattern for marriage. Moses is not the authority on that. God is. From the beginning, it's not so. What's that mean? No, you can't divorce your wife for just any reason because in the original design of marriage, God made them male, God made them female. For this reason, a man shall be joined to his wife, leave his father and mother, the two shall become one. I want you to think about how much is taught there about marriage. A man and a woman. God made them male and female. You are designed by God either as a male or a female. You are not, God didn't mess that up. God didn't, you, you, when God created us, we're made a man or we're made a woman. We're living in a day and age where people seem not to know what we are, but man was made male and female. One man, one woman, come together for life. Not two men and not two women. That's not marriage. One man, one woman coming together for life. Divorce was not part of the original paradigm, that, that it, original design of marriage. And so they said, well, Moses commanded us to. And Jesus said, no, he didn't. Moses permitted you because your heart was already hard to do what you were already doing. But from the beginning, it was not so. And then Jesus said, Whoever divorces his wife, except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her is divorced, commits adultery. What, what, did Jesus say a man could divorce his wife for any reason? Of course not. What's the scriptural reason for divorce? Fornication, uh, uh, sexual, uh, illicit sexual activity with another. That's the idea of fornication. And so Jesus said that only the innocent party can divorce his wife for that reason and remarry. The guilty party doesn't have the right to do that. But friend, Jesus, even that's the exception. God wants people to do their best to stay together and work it out and to make that work. That's God's plan for marriage, to make marriage work. Then in Matthew chapter 20, as we bring our lesson to a close. In Matthew chapter 20, we now learn what the kingdom of the Lord is really like. And the kingdom is like a, a vineyard where spiritual fruit is produced to God. Look at Matthew chapter 20, verse number one. The scripture records these words for us. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. He went out about the third hour, saw others standing out on the market, said to them, you also, and he goes throughout this parable and does this. And, and those who work and those who are diligent, Jesus is willing to pay them for their labor. They receive a reward for that. But there's, again, what's the church like? What's this kingdom like? It's a place of work where fruit, fruit is produced to Almighty God. Some came in early, some came in later, some came in at the last hour. They got what they were promised. The reward was the same. 
but they all came in and they all worked. The place, the church is a place of work where fruit is produced to God. You've got to come into the vineyard and you can't just fill a pew, you can't just sit there and do nothing. It's a place where we're busy and active doing the work of the Lord. And so friend, we ask you today, are you a member of Christ's church? Jesus said, I'll build my church. Are you a member of the church of Christ, the church that Jesus died for? Have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Let me share with you, when the church came into a reality, let me share with you from the New Testament how people became a member of that church. Peter stood up and preached the gospel in Acts chapter 2. They heard that message because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Having heard that Jesus was the Messiah, they believed that. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And people today must believe. Jesus is the Son of God. John chapter 8, verse 24. Peter responded by saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And today, people must repent and be immersed in water so that their sins can be forgiven. And then, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Those who did what Peter said to be saved, God added them to His church. God, not man, added them to His church and they automatically, their names were written on heaven's registrar as they lived faithful. They had the joy and hope of knowing they were right with God. And so friend, we again ask you today, are you a member of the Lord's church? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you submitted to the King of kings and Lord of lords? If not, we encourage you to do that today and join us next time as we study more from the Gospel of Matthew. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your smartphone.